Hello and welcome to video three for week seven. In this video, we'll talk a little bit more about images that we defined in the previous video. And we'll also talk about kernels, a new definition that helps us understand the nature of a transformation and how it affects particularly the dimension of the objects involved. I'm gonna start with a bunch of definitions that we're gonna to use to talk about these objects, kernels, and images. So if I have an M by N matrix, let me remind you that rank is the number of leading ones in its reduced row echelon form. Two things that I can define is I can think of the rows of the matrix, and those rows are matrices or are vectors in our N. We have M rows, so I have M of them, but their length is the number of columns, which is N. So they are they have N coefficients, so they are matrices in our N. So I can look at their span. Um, think of them as matrix, uh, as vectors, look at their span, and I get some, su some linear subspace in Rn. Likewise, the columns, I have n columns, but their length is the number of rows, which is m, so they exist in Rm as vectors in Rm. So I can also ask for the span of the columns, or I think of each column as a vector. Those are two linear subspaces I can consider. It turns out that each of them has dimension equal to the rank. And that I'm going to state without proof. It's not too difficult to prove for rows. It's a little bit trickier to prove for columns. Um, it can be proved, but we will not do that in this video. But it turns out these both have the same dimension there, the dimension of the number of leading ones in the reduced row echelon form. That tells you how many rows are linearly independent, and also how many columns are linearly independent. We'll use these definitions as we go on, but let's go back to image. We defined image in the previous video. Here, I'm just talking about the image of M itself. So in the previous video, we talked about the image of loci, the image of spans. Here, I wanna talk about the image of M, which is all possible outputs. Uh, in other courses, we would call this the range of the function. So Mx on Rn, it's an M by N matrix. So this number, the number of columns, is the dimension of the domain. And let's think about the standard basis of Rn. So E1 is the vector in the first axis direction, E2 is the vector, unit vector in the second axis direction, so forth and so on. So Rn, since this is a basis, can be written as the span of E1, E2, up to En. That's what a basis means. It means that a thing can be written as a span of its basis. So where does this go? Under the transformation, well, it goes to the span of M acting on each of these, so it goes to the span of the vectors M acting on E1, M acting on E2, all the way up to M acting on En. And it turns out these vectors are exactly the columns of M, and I'll do an example in just a moment to sort of illustrate how that works. But what that means is that the image, the set of all outputs, is the same as the span of the columns, because the columns are exactly acting on the standard basis vectors. Acting on the standard basis vectors, the span of all those outputs is the span of the columns, is the image. So why is why are the columns the image of the standard basis vectors? Let's look at this example here in R3. So here are your standard basis vectors in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction. So this is E1, this is E2, this is E3. Now what happens if we do the matrix action here? So we go across and down. Well, this is gonna take negative two and then multiply everything by zero, I'm gonna get negative two. Across and down, this is gonna take seven, multiply it by one, everything else is multiplied by zero, I'm gonna get seven. Negative four multiplied by one, everything else is multiplied by zero, I'm gonna get negative four. And when I do that, I see that I have recovered exactly the first column of the matrix. And it's because of this across and down matrix action that having the one here is I'm always gonna pick up the first thing and everything else gets multiplied by zero. And here having the one here means I'm always gonna pick up the second thing, everything else gets multiplied by zero. So this matrix action gives me exactly the second column. Likewise, having the one here means I pick up all of these, multiply everything else by zero, and I'm gonna get exactly the third column. So in that way, the image of the basis vectors is the columns. The span of all of these things is all of the domain. And so they go to the span of all the places the domain go, all possible outputs, the range. So this span is gonna be the image. The image is the span of the columns. I'm gonna define a new term 
now called a pre-image. So let's think about the same M by N matrix. So the number of columns is the dimension of the domain. The number of rows is the dimension of the target space. So I can take something in the target space. So I have a transformation from our N to our M. And I'm going to take something over here. And I can ask what goes to that vector. And that's what we call a pre-image. So with an image, we had something in here. We say, where does it go? With a pre-image, we have something in the target. We say, where did it come from? It's an important distinction to make sure we understand image is saying, where does this thing go? Pre-image is saying, we have something that is in the target space. Where did it come from? And it may come from nowhere. Not everything in the target space may be in the image of the matrix. The pre-image may be empty. It may be a point. It may be a whole affine or linear subspace. There's all sorts of things that could happen with these pre-images. But it's a really useful piece of notation to say, what goes to this place? Often we care more about where we end up than when we started. We say, what ends up in this place in the start of this transformation? Let's talk about the origin. So if I have, again, an M, M by N matrix, so the origin in the starting domain Rm goes to the origin in Rn. Linear transformations have to preserve the origin. That's one of their properties. But I can ask, what else? What else ends up at 0 in the target? And that's called the kernel. The kernel is everything that gets sent to the 0 vector. So it always includes the 0 vector, but it might include more things. Transformation might take other things that coll it collapses down to 0. We're talking about the zero in the target space, so that means we're talking about pre-images. The kernel is the pre-image of the zero vector. We often, often write it with KER, so the kernel of M is the same as the pre-image of the, of the zero vector, the same as saying what gets sent to zero by this transformation. That's the kernel. That's the idea of a pre-image. How do we actually calculate these? Well, this is, this is lovely, because this takes us back to the notion of systems of equations. So if I have a matrix and I have something in the target space, then I can write this extended matrix where I put the matrix, put a dividing line, and put the target vector u here. And that looks like the matrix of a system. And it turns out that that system is equivalent to asking the pre-image question. So by asking the system that has the matrix M and constants u, is the same thing as saying, what does the transformation M send to the vector U? And we already have the tools for solving systems. We know how to solve systems. We know how to find free parameters. We know how to describe those solutions by free parameters, write them as offset spans. So finding pre-images is exactly the same as solving systems. And that means that the kernel is the system described by M extending it with a matrix of zeros, the solution space of what goes to zero. And again, we'll do that, we'll row reduce it, we'll find its free parameters. All the constants this time will be zero. We describe the solution space by free parameters. We write it as, a, as an offset or not offset span. Since it's the kernel, it will always be just a straight span. It will never be offset because it has to include the origin. We figure out what the free parameters are, free parameters are write it as, as a span, and we will get a nice description of the kernel using techniques we already understand in this course. This is a major theme in linear algebra, that all the things we're doing build on the previous things we've done so tightly that we define one algorithm and we end up using it for many, many, many different things. Solving this system is still going back to the row reduction algorithm. So we're still using the row reduction algorithm, the leading ones, the free parameters, all of those pieces of analysis, now to solve very, very geometric problems about what goes here and what goes there under a transformation. And let me try and really make this, this point that we, we are connecting ideas. So I'm going to write three things on this slide. Um, in the middle here, I have a system of equations. A system of equations can be described by an extended matrix. So we already have a connection between systems of equations and matrices. And we row reduce the matrix to solve the system of equations. That was a really nice connection before. We could use matrix algebra, we could use the row reduction algorithm, all of the procedure of solving a system, keeping track of all the information that was kept track of by this matrix. It was sort of a, a bookkeeping keeping device. 
But now I can give a geometric argu argument and understanding for all of these things. That asking about this system is the same as asking about what does this matrix send to this vector. It's the same as solving the pre-image question. So now we have a geometric interpretation of systems of equations. So I take the coefficients of my system. I think of them as a transformation. X and Y are still unknown. So there's my unknown here. So what goes to some constants under this transformation? Major, major geometric algebraic connection and the, the sort of fullest complete geometric understanding of what a system of equations is. A system of equations is the same thing as calculating a pre-image and calculating a pre-image is accomplished by changing it to a system of equations, changing that to a matrix, row reducing the matrix, solving the system of equations in the way we have already done a number of times in this course. And it all hopefully fits together also in your mind.